Good morning, everybody. So uh, we're going to pick up this morning uh, talking more about the 1920s. Um, I believe you're in chapter 24 of the uh, textbook uh, this week, reading about the, the new era. And uh, today I'm going to speak principally about uh, the presidents of the 1920s and um, the lead up toward the Great Depression. Um, I'm going to speak about um, Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, and uh, just a little bit about the um, the emerging consumer culture of the 1920s that um, sort of uh, precedes um, this uh, enormous um, economic collapse um, that takes place um, in 1929, um, but for which there were some hints, some clues, some, some forewarnings, um, some patterns of instability in the economy. Um, that experts did not um, pick up on. I'm going to take a sec here and close these blinds and get a little bit of glare. Okay. That's a little better. Um, so let me get started here. Um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, as uh, you may remember, uh, had uh, suffered um, a paralytic stroke uh, while campaigning for the League of Nations. Um, which um, the United States Senate <laughs> never approved um, the Versailles Treaty um, because of their disagreement with the uh, League of Nations Covenant. Um, and Wilson's political career um, really ends in 1919, um, despite the fact that he himself was up for a third term as president, but the Democratic Party uh, wanted no part of that. And uh, in 1920, they would nominate uh, James Cox uh, as their uh, presidential candidate. Um, the Republican Party, um, and it's kind of interesting because we have two Ohioans running against each other. James uh, H. Cox uh, was the governor of Ohio, was the Democratic candidate. The Republican candidate for president that year was uh, Senator um, Warren G. Harding of Ohio, um, who was a, sort of an unremarkable guy, um, not known as a, a speech maker, not known as a great um, intellectual idealist, um, sort of a, a real sort of run-of-the-mill politician who's um, sort of mediocrity, as your textbook describes. It was what was one of his most appealing features to people. And um, besides being handsome and grandfatherly, um, he just gave a, a sense of sort of um, stability, right, um, that people were looking for following all this post-war upheaval um, that I was describing to you uh, in our last lecture, right? So uh, Warren G. Harding uh, campaigned in 1920 on uh, the uh, the slogan, uh, a return to normalcy, and which is kind of interesting because with what we're going through right now with this uh, pandemic, everyone, is uh, you're hearing this phrase uh, recycle itself 100 years later. Um, you know, 100 years ago, um, a return to normalcy in 1920 was um, a phrase, a slogan of um, Harding's promising Americans uh, a return to stability um, in, in the uh, very hectic and volatile years uh, after World War One. And here uh, we are 100 years later, exactly, uh, with people craving a return to normalcy. So kind of ironic. Um, Anyway, Harding would win the 1920 election uh, very easily. Um, but, uh, people had um, sort of soured at that point on um, idealistic democratic politics of Woodrow Wilson um, and uh, wanted uh, something a little simpler and um, more traditional. Um, Wilson's idealism had taken them into a very horrible war. Um, and uh, people had had enough of uh, his uh, progressive politics at that point. So um, what happened during Harding's administration uh, and what are some of the chief uh, excuse me, points we could talk about with Warren G. Harding? Um, well, number one would be um, the economy. So after the First World War, the United States went into a recession for a number of years beginning primarily in about 19, end of 1919, 1920. And we start to see uh, the recession get turned around by about 1922. There's visible signs of, of economic recovery. Um, 
And the whole reason for this is quite simple. The United States had to refit uh, its production capacity, right? So we had uh, changes in the workforce, soldiers coming home, wanting their jobs back, people who had replaced them, uh, in many cases, women and African-Americans being displaced from jobs, or as I mentioned in the lecture, soldiers coming back and not being able to get their jobs back, so they're, so they're unemployed. Um, and then there was the whole question of the nation's factories being repurposed, right? And, and we're actually seeing that going on right now as well. We see companies like um, GM making ventilators for this crisis, right? Well, during uh, the First World War, uh, Ford wasn't making Model Ts. They were making lorries or trucks uh, for transporting soldiers. They were making ambulances, right? Companies were asked to make different things. Um, in some cases, uh, airplanes, uh, you know, fighter airplanes. Uh, some of the companies out in the Northwest Pacific where there was a lot of lumber. So companies were asked to produce different things for the war during the First World War for wartime. And then when we went into peacetime, they had to um, redesign their factories. Machinery had to be changed out to go back to making the pre peacetime products they formerly did. So this led to a lot of industrial upheaval during this period. And as, as market demand shifted for peacetime products instead of wartime products, right? And then you had these wartime surpluses. What do we do with them? So um, this led to some economic dislocation. And then there was also the agricultural piece, right? And we'll get more into this uh, in the lecture on uh, the, the uh, causes of the depression. But with agriculture, America had been producing for Europeans, right? European farmers were all shooting each other. They were all drafted. They were all in the armies of France and Germany and England and Russia and Italy. And so the United States was providing food to much of Europe. There was a, an amazing demand for American agricultural products. So American farmers uh, were expanding their operations. They were getting very high prices for their for their produce. Then one day, the European farmers stopped shooting each other. There was an armistice. The war was over. And what did they do? They put down their guns. They lost their uniforms. And they went back to their farms. And they started growing their own food again. All of a sudden, the demand for American agricultural products crashed. Okay, and um, a lot of American farmers had overextended themselves uh, because of the uh, high demand for their products. Um, and so there's this complete kind of conversion going on in uh, the American farming sector as well. Of uh, All suddenly prices for American produce dropped. There's a glutted market, right? There's, there's a big surplus and no demand for it. So there are all kinds of kinks in the economy that have to get worked out um, after the war. So this recession, uh, so just to give you an idea of what Harding walked into, um, is a big deal. And there's high unemployment. I think it got up to about 14%. And within two years, Harding fixed this, um, largely due to some good appointments. Uh, so his sec he's, he's famous for having a cabinet that had very good appointees and very bad appointees, some highly competent and some highly scandalous. Um, so his good appointments were certainly um, Andrew Mellon, uh, he of Mellon Bank. You may have heard of Carnegie Mellon University or Mellon Bank. Um, he was a Pittsburgh guy, Andrew Mellon. Uh, he was the Secretary of the Treasury, brilliant financier. Um, one of uh, um, Harding's uh, chief uh, advisors, economic advisors, was Harvey Firestone, uh, someone he knew well from uh, being from Ohio. Um, Firestone, obviously, of, of Firestone Rubber and Tire, uh, was uh, a very, very successful industrialist who was an advisor to Harding. And then also um, Herbert Hoover, who um, was appointed Secretary of Commerce. In fact, they created um, the Department of Commerce during Harding's administration just to get um, a cabinet post for Herbert Hoover because he was considered such a brilliant organizational mind. So this this sort of troika or um, uh, T-R-O-I-K-A, it's a 
uh, Russian term, but this this combination, these three guys, right, uh, Mellon, um, Hoover, and Firestone uh, work with Harding, um, and uh, he basically rides them to success in turning the economy around in about two years um, and sets it on um, a track for just tremendous growth um, like the country had not yet seen uh, during the 1920s. Um, so this is one major accomplishment of uh, Harding's administration. Um, another was uh, disarmament. Um, one of the questions, of course, after the First World War was, how do we not have another war like this again? Um, and so this is the, the important foreign policy piece of uh, Harding's administration. Of course, he, he does seek to improve um, relations with uh, Latin American countries um, following a series of interventions that took place uh, during Wilson's um, presidency. But um, on, on the international stage, um, the Washington Naval Conference takes place um, during um, Harding's presidency in 1921-22. Um, and this was a, a major disarmament conference that took place in Washington. Um, the idea being to limit um, the size of the world's navies. Um, the United States, Britain, and Japan had become the three largest um, naval powers. And uh, the United States had been, uh, as I think I mentioned in class, concerned with Japanese activity in the Pacific uh, for quite a long time. Um, J Japanese ambitions in the Pacific were becoming very clear. Um, the United States was preparing for a naval war with the Japanese as early as 1900 um, over the Pacific. And uh, so the United States, Britain, and uh, Japan, along with France and Italy, um, the world's five largest naval powers, uh, Germany had been forced to scrap, that is, scuttle its entire navy um, after the First World War as a provision of the um, Paris Peace Treaty, so the Versailles Treaty. So these five powers gather in Washington, D.C. to discuss naval disarmament. Um, and Charles Evans Hughes, um, the U.S. Secretary of State, proposed just scrapping battleships. And this is exactly what happened. Um, the United States, Britain, and uh, Japan um, scrapped a number of capital ships, that would be battleships or heavy cruisers, uh, in order to sort of disarm uh, and prevent an arms race. Remembering that the weapon of mass destruction at this point in time still was the battleship. Um, the calculus that came out of this conference was unfavorable to Japan. Um, it limited um, Japanese ambitions by reducing the size of its battle fleet. This did not sit well with the Japanese. And so what they did was they began experimenting with um, putting flight decks for airplanes on some of their existing uh, cruisers or battleships, or rather uh, converting ones that they were supposed to scrap into um, early prototype aircraft carriers. And so the Japanese begin to experiment with this idea of naval aviation in the early 1920s, years before the US or British um, consider this notion. Uh, there is such a thing as naval aviation. There are Navy pilots, but this idea of, of taking off and landing off of plane, off of ships, uh, the Japanese really begin to pioneer this in the 1920s as a way to sort of get around um, the, the treaty that comes out of the Washington Naval Conference. So as a result, Japanese get a big head start on the United States in terms of carrier tactics. And of course, we'll see how that plays out um, early in the Second World War. Um, Harding's uh, presidency was also um, known for scandal. Uh, Warren G. Harding um, had some bad um, cabinet members, as I mentioned. Um, uh, Albert Fall, his Secretary of the Interior, um, was uh, actually convicted uh, in the uh, famous Teapot Dome scandal um, in 1923. He had been um, U.S. Naval um, 
strategic oil reserve in Wyoming in a place called a Teapot Dome. Um, Fall had been behind on his taxes and actually uh, took bribes from uh, petroleum executives to sell uh, the Navy's oil uh, to these petroleum companies so that they could, uh, you know, make a profit. And uh, he, he pocketed um, several hundred thousand dollars uh, and wound up doing jail time uh, for these uh, shady transactions, actually, you know, just um, profiteering off his office. Um, and one of uh, the attorney general, Harry Doherty, who had actually been Harding's campaign advisor, um, uh, was also uh, very nearly convicted. And um, one of his um, employees actually was was caught in a scandal and uh, committed suicide. So there were some very um, shady uh, goings on during Harding's administration. Um, Harding's uh, had some guys that he uh, sort of drinking buddies of his um, from his days in Ohio politics, known as the Ohio Gang, who also got a number of um, federal offices. Um, so they took sort of lesser positions in government. In fact, Darty had, um, you know, part of the scandal with Darty was that he was actually, um, you know, giving out judgeships and, and, and things like that, um, sort of selling offices um, from his position as the attorney general. He, he managed to escape um, prison, though. And then there were um, Warren G. Harding, uh, his own scandals. Um, he was a, a well-known philanderer, um, uh, sort of a, a serial cheater, if you will, uh, on his wife, um, even um, having an affair um, with uh, a secretary and uh, getting her pregnant, um, you know, while married as president. Uh, so he makes uh, Bill Clinton sort of like Mr. Rogers in that respect. Um, so Harding uh, uh, really uh, conducted himself, I guess, what we say unpresidentially um, in his own quiet way. Um, and uh, but despite that, um, Harding uh, was considered very progressive at the time, and and um, he he angered a lot of uh, people, uh, particularly in the South, and um, people in the Democratic Party, um, for his views on race and um, and women's rights. So he um, uh, was. Uh, looking to advance um, women and um, African-Americans, particularly in the South. He really took Southern Democrats to task um, for the treatment of African-Americans, called them out in a number of public speeches. And one of them uh, is a document um, in, uh, in your reader for the record um, that, that we'll take a look at. Uh, Harding would die uh, while in office in 1923. Um, apparently, uh, they said it was uh, food poisoning was the official cause of death. He was on a tour of the uh, west coast of the United States and um, Alaska on, on a cruise. Um, uh, apparently, the cause of death, food poisoning, was a result of his eating too much Dungeness crab on the on the on the trip. And apparently, he had a um, uh, you know an allergic uh, reaction uh, was. A, cause of the food poisoning because he had that uh, shellfish um, uh, issue was w what was reported. Um, some conspiracy theorists have, have um, put out the idea that Mrs. Uh, Harding um, poisoned him uh, as payback for his uh, cheating on her. That's been a conspiracy theory that's been out there for years, but has never been given um, a whole lot of credit. But nonetheless, um, Harding uh, would die uh, during this cruise. Uh, uh, he, he would, uh, you know, officially pass away in San Francisco. Um, and with that, the presidency passed to his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, who was a, a, a very um, sort of strict, straight-laced um, New England uh, Republican from Vermont. Um, he's been called Silent Cal. He's been called Cool Cal Coolidge. Um, when um, Coolidge comes on the scene, uh, he's probably the most pro-business president we've ever had. Um, and he was uh, a man of few words, um, uh, very little to say. Uh, he was very uh, sort of puritanical, very strict, very proper. Um, he was anti-labor. Um, 
had a very sort of modern Republican economic point of view. In other words, um, believed that the market uh, should determine outcomes, that um, America should be a land of uh, opportunity, um, but that American, the purpose of the country, government, um, and markets was not to um, ensure equality, but to ensure equality of opportunity. And then based on your own hard work and or talents, um, outcomes would be decided. So he did not believe in uh, unions um, ensuring outcomes for workers and things like that. So um, he believed that market forces would produce the greatest good. Um, and he presided over, at that point, the best economy in American history. Um, he would, you know, much like... Um, Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the president here. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, excuse me. Much like Johnson, who would take over for Kennedy in uh, 1963, in the fall of 1963, um, Coolidge would take over the presidency in, in the fall of 1923, and then immediately have to go into campaigning for the presidency the following year. Same thing as happened to uh, LBJ in 63. 64 would be an election year. Well, same thing for Coolidge. 1924 would be an election year. So he's really not running on his record uh, because he doesn't really have one. He's been vice president. Um, and uh, with the death of Harding, um, Coolidge is really running on the success of the economy that's been created under Harding. Um, he's also running against some pretty unpopular people in 1924. Uh, one guy's got a Klan endorsement. Um, the other one is um, a uh, an Irish Catholic from New York, Al Smith, who's um, uh, looking to end prohibition at that time. So you had um, a couple of people that really weren't registering with the American public who, given the success of the economy at the time, uh, really didn't see any reason to want to change anything. So... Um, Coolidge is overwhelmingly elected. Uh, I should say re-elected. He sort of succeeded to the presidency and then is is re-elected as president, although he was never elected. It was actually the first time he was elected, right? Um, so he, he wins uh, on a margin of, I think he gets twice as many votes as uh, the Democratic candidate uh, that year, something like 15 million to 8 million. He, he outpolls um his, uh, I think it was Davis, was his um, Democratic challenger. He uh, sort of whips him in the popular vote. Um, so Coolidge um, is, uh, you know, famous for saying basically that the, the business of America is business. That's, that's, that's why we're here, right? And um, he was really uh, looking at the nation's economic growth as um, the great focus of his presidency. And he, he didn't really get involved in a whole lot of other things. Um, and he believed that minding his own business was was really his role. I mean, if you want to talk about laissez-faire, the idea of government keeping its hands off, um, this Coolidge was was really the poster child for that, right? Uh, he's just, he's literally going to do nothing as president. Um, uh, he's probably best known for breaking up the Boston police strike in 1925. Uh, is probably uh, the act he's probably best known for other than saying that the business of America is, is business. Um, one of the things we will see him do, and this will, will come into play during uh, our conversation about Herbert Hoover and how he dealt with the Great Depression, um, and that's going to be a separate lecture when I begin to talk about uh, Hoover and Roosevelt and how they dealt with the Depression. Uh, there was this um, campaign uh, in the um, early to mid-1920s called McNary Hauganism. And it was named after a senator and a congressman, McNary, uh, M-C-N-A-R-Y, and uh, Haugen, uh, that were proposing farm bills, in other words, farm aid bills, um, to provide government assistance to farmers who were struggling uh, in the wake of World War I. I described how uh, there were glutted agricultural markets, huge farm surpluses that were causing prices to crash. And um, these two congressmen co-sponsored co a bill um, that would direct the United States uh, government to sort of buy up um, the farmer's surplus and then sort of sell it on world markets in order to stabilize uh, 
the prices of farm goods and also to sort of put tariffs on uh, imported farm goods to also, again, try to stabilize prices for American farm products. Uh, this was important because by, by 1924, 40% uh, of American farmers uh, had lost their properties um, in, in the wake of the First World War and, 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 and this sort of economic distress that farmers were going through. That's that, that's significant number. So two out of five farmers had lost their farms uh, by the mid-1920s. Um, both of these bills passed through Congress handily. Uh, this bill was uh, vetoed by Coolidge, came up again the following year, and he again vetoed it. So he's also very well known for his vetoes of the, um, very well known for those of, who care to take time to read or listen to anything about Calvin Coolidge. Okay, um, he's well known for uh, his veto of these two McNary Haugen bills. Um, well, what this really did was begin to um, solidify um, and reconstitute the old populist alliance of um, farmers of the southern and western states that had really been um, the, the motive political force behind the populist movement of the 1880s and 90s. Um, so we start to see that pieced back together again, <clears throat> and interestingly, um, stretching across both Democratic and Republican lines. Um, there was a, a, a block of Republican senators um, who were firmly behind um, the, these farm bills in the 1920s. So it wasn't just a Democratic operation. Most of your populists uh, of the 1880s and 90s were drawn from Democratic ranks. And in this case, we see a large uh, Republican constituency um, and, and active um, uh, Republican senators behind this, like George Norris, of, of Nebraska, who you read the document from, Gerald Nye of North Dakota, Hiram Johnson of California, William Bora of Idaho, and um, uh, the, the gentleman from Georgia, whose name I don't recall at the moment, um, and it will, it will come to me at a later date. But this sort of, um, this uh, little sort of uh, block, I guess is the proper term you use politically, B-L-O-C, uh, this farm block, as they were known um, in the Republican Party, uh, begins to work with Democratic politicians to try to get uh, sort of uh, better conditions for American farmers. And this will become uh, really a big political issue during the Depression when these matters get worse. Um, so Coolidge uh, will finish out his second term on, on a very high note. The economy is, is looking great at the time. Um, uh, of course, your textbook, uh, and, and we'll talk about these questions in the other lecture. Actually, I noticed um, in looking at your textbook chapter that does mention these questions of uh, wealth inequality um, that your textbook will blame uh, for um, the Depression. Um, questions of how um, industrialists and those who are producing and mass producing uh, consumer goods in the 1920s are reinvesting their profits, whether it's into R&D and machinery, or whether it's in uh, wage raises for workers. And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those questions um, uh, in a future lecture about the Depression itself. But um, uh, Coolidge will just ride off into the sunset. So because he had been um, elected to the presidency only one time uh, in 24, Coolidge could have put himself up for re-election in 1928, but decided not to. Um, a really interesting choice. Uh, and in a recent biography of Coolidge um, that came out about five years ago, Amity Scales, who's um, uh, an author writing sort of biographies, um, uh, recent, you know, a current writer, um, had some interesting views on Coolidge's retirement, said um, she wrote that um, Coolidge had watched Wilson uh, destroy himself and go out of office in a wheelchair um, campaigning for the League of Nations. And he had watched Harding die on the job uh, during this tour of the Western states. And he did not want that to happen to him. And what he was interested in was going back to Vermont and fishing with his grandchildren. And he felt as though he had done his public service. 
He had spent enough years as a senator, enough years in Massachusetts legislature. He had put in his um, years as vice president, as president. He was leaving the country with a good economy, and he was now going to just go have his family time. And uh, how many politicians do we see do that? Uh, so I, I always found that a very remarkable uh, choice uh, by Coolidge to just ride off into the sunset uh, on top as far as he saw it. So this opened up um, for the 1928 election um, an interesting choice. The Democrats would nominate um, Al Smith um, from New York City after um, they and the Republic, they learned they could not get Herbert Hoover. So interesting sort of thing happening in 1927-28 is that both parties are trying to get the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, to be their candidate. Uh, reminds me a lot of the 1992 election when both the Republican and Democratic parties were seeking uh, General Colin Powell, uh, who had been the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff and oversaw um, uh, Operation Desert Storm and uh, in the first Iraq War, 1991. Colin Powell was pretty much a rock star uh, at that point. And in 1992, both the Republicans and Democrats were battling to get Powell to agree to be their presidential uh, nominee. Uh, however, he didn't uh, have an interest in a role in politics at that time, and he declined um, both parties. Of course, he would later become Secretary of State for George W. Bush. But um, at that point, he was not interested in a political role. Hoover, at this point, Secretary of Commerce, both parties want him. Uh, his personal ideology and views are much more um, aligned with um, the Republican um, sort of worldview at that point. Um, his book, of course, American Individualism in 1922, clearly outlined um, his views that his ideology was really individualism. Um, an American uh, brand of individual, individualism, excuse me, that guaranteed an equality of opportunity and did not put the government uh, in, a, in in the way of determining outcome. So this was really much more in line with the Republican point of view. Um, Hoover uh, has been referred to uh, by one of his biographers, um, Joan Hoff Wilson, who uh, used to be a professor at the University of Arizona, referred to him as the forgotten progressive. Uh, Hoover, really interesting guy, um, was orphaned at the age of nine, um, Ray, oh, he, he grew up in oh, Iowa and then um, became an orphan when his parents died. He was raised by uh, uncles. Um, uh, he eventually moved out to the West Coast uh, to live with family members on the West Coast. Um, really, the portrait of the self-made man. Um, he became uh, one of the first graduates of Stanford University. Um, Stanford University uh, was endowed... Um, by Leland Stanford, who had been chairman of the Central Pacific Railroad, which was involved in building the Transcontinental Railroad uh, in the 1860s. Uh, Leland Stanford endowed uh, Stanford University, um, and um, Hoover would attend there and uh, you know, graduate very high in his class uh, with degrees in engineering, and became really the world's foremost uh, mining engineer. Um, he became uh, a consulting, a consulting uh, engineer. He was brought in uh, all over the world um, to figure out difficult um, engineering problems, charged his consultant's fee, made huge money, uh, invested in oil, became even richer. So he was a self-made millionaire, um, smarter than most people. Um, he knew it. Um, he was a problem solver. He had never run into a problem he couldn't solve. Uh, he was the guy that Wilson brought in during the First World War to sort of help rationalize um, American food production and distribution so that we could feed our own people, feed the people of Europe, and feed uh, our army, um, and did a brilliant job with all those things, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. One of the most beloved people, he was actually known after the First World War and during as the great humanitarian. That was the name brand he built for himself. So, um, and then he came in and um, helped Harding uh, 
um, and his cabinet members, became a cabinet member, right, and helped uh, reverse the post-war recession. So there was never a problem Herbert Hoover hadn't been able to solve. Um, and his belief was in rationalizing the economy. He believed that if the government, and this is interesting, his view on what was the government's role in the economy. And he really um, used the secretary, um, excuse me, the, um, the Department of Commerce to do this, information gathering. And um, this is really Hoover the technocrat, right? But this idea of technocracy, which began to um, arise in the late um, 19-teens and early 1920s, uh, was the idea that these engineers, these experts, could solve the problems that there were these the special class of people uh, who gathered and possessed information who were our problem solvers, right? And um, the uh, cultural critic Thorstein Veblen um, wrote a very important book in 1917 called The Engineers and the Price System, uh, in which he um, examines and critiques this, this new class of technocrats who were beginning to become the nation's uh, decision makers during the progressive era. Um, but he believed that the economy could be rationalized, that we could have predictable economies, um, that all, if we gathered enough information uh, about the economy, uh, we could set it on a course like an engine where it would just run and occasionally we would need to add a little oil or change a filter or tighten a screw or change a belt. And the, we could get the economy to operate like an engine um, that was predictable and only required tweaking. Um, to keep it running at a steady pace. Um, and so he wanted the government to become this great clearinghouse of information, whereby economic leaders, uh, rather than having the government intervene in the economy to help out various um, sectors, uh, those sectors could just go to the government for information and solve their own problems uh, to work out um, issues in any particular economic sector. So we would not have seen um, the sorts of bank and auto industry bailouts that we saw uh, with the Obama administration in 2008-2009. We would not see the types of packages we're seeing the government putting together right now um, to deal with the pandemic, um, loans to small business, um, uh, you know, uh, packages to help uh, shore up um, industries like um, uh, airplanes, uh, cruise ships, hotels, you know, these sorts of industries that are suffering um, right now that are getting economic assistance, uh, assistance, excuse me, none of this would have taken place uh, under Hoover. Hoover believed in something called voluntary associationalism. Okay? Voluntary associationalism was the idea that if there was a trouble in your economic sector, Leaders of that industry would voluntarily associate, in other words, get themselves together and figure out how to fix the problem in their industry. And they could um, appeal to the federal government for data, for reports, for information about trends and, and numbers and things like that. And the government would provide the data to them, but then it was up to them to put their heads together and figure out the problem. This was the role of government. Um, in economic um, times of economic tumult, right? This is what the government would do. The government was a clearinghouse of statistical information for businesses, uh, and then the businesses could work it out, and this um, would help us to have predictable economies. Um, this was also a way to prevent further recessions and disturbances in the economy. By this kind of private cooperation, um, this was not a statist intervention. This was not a government intervention in the economy. This was the private sector cooperating to fix its problems, just getting statistical in, in information from the government. Okay, So um, because we're in a, in a current um, unfortunate pattern of government uh, having to act, putting out a $2 trillion uh, package to try to bail out citizens, bail out small businesses, bail out big businesses, um, and then, of course, help the, the uh, healthcare systems. Um, we would not have seen this kind of an intervention by Hoover. Um, then there was his other theory, 
So voluntary associationalism was one big part of Hoover's sort of ideology for the economy. The other was cooperative individualism, right? So I know you'll be pausing your videos and going back to hear me say these things again. Voluntary associationalism and cooperative individualism. Cooperative individualism uh, was something that operated more at state and local levels. And this was the idea that um, it was for people in counties, it was for people in states, it was for people in communities to work together, individuals cooperating, right, to solve problems at community, county, state, and local levels, right, um, rather than the federal government intervening itself in places where it did not belong. It was not the place of the federal government to involve itself in an issue in, let's say, Camden County, New Jersey. That was a matter that people uh, of Camden or Cherry Hill or Lindenwald, pick your township, right, Magnolia. County government, Camden County government, freeholders, et cetera, or perhaps state uh, would involve themselves um, to deal with issues in their, um, in their county, in their congressional district, or in their particular state, right? Those were the levels that were appropriate. A federal intervention in the matters of state and local was not appropriate uh, in Herbert Hoover's um, sort of ideology of what was the relationship between federal and state. Um, so this has been viewed um, controversially because people have different views about these things. Um, and we'll look at how this aligns with some of the ideas, because remember, th this is the sort of philosophy of government uh, and the economy that Hoover is going to bring to the Great Depression, right? He's going to view um, the manifestation and the events of the Great Depression and the sorts of programs and policies that he will put in place um, are going to be because he views the um, American system of government uh, the economy and the world through this lens, right? The world of government and business uh, and economics uh, are viewed by Hoover through the lens of these ideologies. And this is how he's going to approach them. And it'll be quite different as we'll see from um, Franklin Roosevelt. So, um, you know, was the economy good at the time? Sure, I mean, under Coolidge, I mean, just to backtrack a bit, um, to give you an idea of what Hoover's inheriting, right? Uh, under Coolidge, the economy was running great. Um, there was uh, high levels of prosperity. Um, half of the World War I debt had been retired. <clears throat> there were important new consumer industries in the 1920s that really um, were the foundations for the um, incredible economic growth. See, I'm showing growth. Right? Um, there was... Um, what we call, call durable goods industries, right? So durable goods just means stuff, stuff. I can put my hands on durable goods. Um, these were um, automobiles, um, uh, appliances like dishwashers and, uh, excuse me, refrigerators and, um, uh, yeah, dishwashers, right? So, so appliances, um, automobiles, radios were big, um, and uh, what else? Yeah, those are the big ones, really. You know, automobiles, refrigerators, washing machines, and other appliances, um, and radio, and then advertising. Because advertising industry really, really takes off after the First World War. I mean, it had had its initial sort of iterations I talked about when we talked about the Industrial Revolution and how people remembered the rotary press and people were beginning to advertise in um, these, these penny presses that came out and Sears and Roebuck began to mail out catalogs. You probably read about that in your textbook. I didn't discuss that, but you know, the sort of advent of Sears and Roebuck and department stores and mail order catalogs and these sorts of things um, in the latter 19th century. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, I, I recommend you take Professor Wallison's consumer culture class. She goes into this stuff in you know very fine grained detail. Um, but the advertising industry in the 1920s um, explodes Radio will play a big role in that. Um, and, um, you know, Madison Avenue advertising, like as we think of it today, um, you know, where advertising is an industry, right? I'm talking about people going into the advertising industry, marketing, right? 
that's when this really begins to take off in the 1920s. And so for the first time, Americans are being sold lifestyles, ways of living. If I brush my teeth with this product, uh, I'm going to have a new confidence, quack, 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 right? If I, if I drive this kind of car, I'm telling my family, I, you know, I care and we're, we're saying something about who we are, right? The whole keeping up with the Joneses thing really becomes a, a fact of American life. Um, you know, a real sort of public focus on materialism uh, begins to come into play in the 1920s. So with this creation of lifestyles, with this economic growth, um, with this uh, advertisement of the lifestyles, it really puts the focus of the average American on these things. And as I said, there are going to be some underlying weaknesses in the economy that people are not going to be paying attention to. These sort of rippling undercurrents below this very um, successful economy based on these uh, durable goods um, because because of the of the high level of focus on automobiles and, and and jazz music and the radios and the and the washing machines and the new conveniences right that people are really paying attention to what's called the new mass culture of the 1920s it's a good way of putting it they call it these are these are things parts of lifestyles that people begin to um, gravitate around this new mass culture um, so this is what Herbert Hoover inherits in 1928. Um, 1928 will be um, an important year uh, with respect to presidential campaigns um, because in 1927, of course, uh, we could talk about the first radio station, right? So the first radio station, just to backtrack real quick, went on the air in 1920. Uh, that was KDKA uh, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That would be the first uh, radio station in the United States. Um, it's local. We'll see other local radio stations come online now do, with this technology in the 1920s. WGN in Chicago, right? They're famous for covering the Scopes trial when it went on. The first um, radio station with a national bandwidth, right, that could be heard from coast to coast, literally went online in 19, or I should say went on the air in 1927. And what was the first? Um, radio station that could broadcast nationally. Jeopardy music plays. The NBC, the National Broadcasting Corporation. Duh, right? Okay. So NBC, uh, the first national broadcasting corporation, that goes on the air in 1927. And so the 1928 election, um, which comes down to the candidacies of Herbert Hoover, the Republican, and Al Smith, the Democrat, is the first sort of mass media um, presidential campaign where radio will play a role. Just as 1960, Lincoln and, um, uh, excuse me, 1860 was Lincoln, 1960, Nixon, I'm thinking of, and uh, Kennedy will be uh, really largely determined by TV debates. Um, the television will play the great role in 1960. Now, of course, we have you know, internet and social media playing a role in elections. But in 1920, uh, eight, excuse me, 1928, it was radio. And um, how will radio play a difference? Because Herbert Hoover and Al Smith will be speaking to the people of America as they campaign on the radio. And on NBC, uh, which they'll both use, people across America will hear both of them. Remember that the American South is heavily democratic, right? Heavily democratic, and, and a lot of the, the, the race issues that we're reading about in this chapter, um, we see people like Harding uh, castigating Southern Democrats for their treatment of African Americans, right? Um, in fact, when Harding proposed an anti-lynching bill um, during his presidency, it was Southern uh, Democratic senators who blocked it. Um, Right. So um, and they would do the same thing to FDR, actually, um, in order to get his New Deal bills uh, passed during the Great Depression. Um, uh, FDR had to play a ball with Southern Democratic leaders. And so uh, when uh, FDR wanted to get uh, anti-lynching laws passed in the 1930s, he couldn't get it done because Southern Democratic senators uh, blocked them. 
So anyway, uh, when he's going on the airwaves nationally, Southern Democrats and people from all over the nation are hearing Hoover and hearing Smith on the radio. Hoover's a guy who grew up in Iowa uh, and um, Oregon, I believe it was. Very sort of plain spoken, humble, unexceptional speaker. Sounds like a normal, everyday guy. Al Smith was from the Tammany Hall um, political machine of the Lower East Side of New York City. And Al Smith sounded like a New Yorker, or as somebody in the South might say, a New Yorker, a New Yorker, or a, a Yankee. And so in listening to these people on the radio, Southern Democrats who are listening, and Southerners in general, who are listening to Smith on the radio get turned off by his New York accent. He, 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 he is, sounds more like a Yankee than Hoover. And this is going to play a big role in the election results because numerous Southern Democrats, instead of voting with their own party and voting for Smith, are turned off by one, his um, New York accent, and two, his anti-prohibition stance. Because Southerners, although they were... Um, well, while well, Southern Democrats were actually more conservative uh, than um, Northern Democrats. So by nature, they tended to be more, I mean, despite the fact that moonshining and things like that go, go on in the American South, typical Southerners were more conservative and more uh, favorable toward prohibition than um, were Northern Democrats. So that's sort of two strikes against Smith in the South. He's got the New York accident, and he's a wet. And being a wet meant you were anti-prohibition. If you were a dry, that meant you were for prohibition. So Hoover winds up winning the election um, basically because of radio, because people in the South didn't like what Al Smith sounded like. So it's the first time in American history we start to see the impact of mass media uh, on on politics in a big way. Of course, there had been newspaper wars over politics, and we can we can follow that stuff back to the 1790s. But this is the first time that modern media will play a role uh, in an election result. Okay, so uh, um, that's all we have for this lecture. So I'm going to stop right there. I think I've gone on long enough for about 52 minutes here. So um, I'll pick up next talking about the Great Depression and um, so. Uh, briefly some of the causes of it, and then we'll start talking about how Herbert Hoover uh, dealt with the problems of the Great Depression, okay? So um, have a great week and a great weekend, and I'll put up another lecture for you next week.